Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Scary Thoughts, Horror, Philosophy, Culture. I'm Mark Kate. And I'm Chad Lott. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about The Neon Demon. Which is by director uh, Nicholas Winding Refn. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing his middle name correctly. But uh, as if you see this movie, he's gone beyond having a name. And now he only has a monogram, which is at the very beginning of the film. It looks so, a little bit like the Yves Saint Laurent logo. Uh, that's exactly what I thought. Um, if this is your first time listening to us, welcome. We're happy to have you. Uh, go on iTunes. Please give us a review. We're not making any money off this. Hopefully one day we'll be rich and famous. And if you want to help us get there, please leave us a, a rating, write a review. And if you're into inspirational messaging with uh, Gore, uh, check out our Instagram page. It's at scarythoughts.podcast. And in the next episode, we just about 60 seconds ago decided we will be covering... The House of the Devil, uh, which is a request from my buddy Justin Devine, who is an excellent illustrator. Um, his Instagram handle is at jlawdevine, I think. And uh, go check him out. He draws scary shit. And just a little note at the top here. We hope that you've seen this movie. Uh, because this is going to be spoiler filled and the, the vibe here is that uh, we're a couple friends and you've joined us to sit around and talk about this uh, this weird art house movie. All right. So where do you want to start, Chad? Well, I think we may as well start at the beginning. Where's Sounds good. That, uh, you know, we just discussed the monogram at the beginning yeah. of the film. I don't know that I've ever seen that a director do that before. Me neither. I mean, there have definitely been a lot of directors, and they're all sort of under the auteur mm -hmm. uh, uh, heading, which I'd love to get into a lot more later. Yeah. There are definitely all these ways that directors put in their trademarks, like, say, Woody Allen's typeface or something mm -hmm. like that, which has always been consistent through his career. But yeah, having your logo, that's pretty good. Yeah. And like you said, it seems like a definite nod to the YSL brand. In, in that opening credit sequence, you see the tone shifts from that blue to purple to red, which you'll see repeated throughout the movie, which uh, the director says is a shift from innocence to, I guess, evil. Uh, he described the shift to red a few different ways. And with that first really powerful opening image of the, the main character, Jesse, played by Elle Fanning, she's on a couch and her, uh, her throat has been slit in some sort of like art house la murder scene and the the camera pulls back and at first you're not really quite clear is, is she dead is she not dead you don't really know what's going on in the movie uh and really the first thing you see is her blue eyes which i think is really something to think about as we get to discussing the end of the movie where you really one of the last things you see is her blue eye another thing to think about is how well lit and photographed the scene is because later in the movie these photographs are described as amateurish and shitty. Like the guy who, it's <laughs> it's her uh, boyfriend that she's met on like Craigslist or something like that to come photograph her so she can enter the world of modeling. So the, the main character is Jessie, who is a small town girl from who knows where. And she's come to LA with like basically like a suitcase and a dream, pretty much the Welcome to the Jungle video, but with a girl. And... She's very beautiful, very striking. Uh, she's very underage, uh, which is a, a plot point. She's 16 years old when the movie starts, and she's come to L.A. to make it. I think one thing that's really striking about the opening scene is that it's identical to the movie The Eyes of Laura Mars. Have you seen that? No. Oh, so good. Uh, Fade on Away. Both films start with very aestheticized violence against women mm -hmm. as a photo shoot. And... So this movie in particular, it starts with this photo shoot that's just sort of reveling in the still image of a woman's dead body. And then they go to see this performance, she and the other models, mm -hmm. go to see this performance of this sort of hentai performance, which is another sort of like aestheticization of violence against women. And are you talking in the other movie or is that that's what happens in Neon Demon? Sorry, just the Neon Demon oh, okay, performance. Okay. Yeah, not, sure. not Eyes of Laura Mars. But um, it really sort of sets up what you have as an expectation as a viewer, because, I mean, I don't know if this is necessarily a horror film, and I think this, that sort of taxonomy isn't necessarily mm -hmm. useful for this, but as a viewer of this aestheticized violence, it really pulls you into wanting that. You become mm -hmm. the predator, you become the gaze that this film really is all about. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I think that opening uh, faux murder also just really justifies it as a horror film out the gate because it doesn't become a horror film until very late. And then, I mean, I guess a horror film, maybe? Well, it's hard to say because if you pull out, I mean, jumping ahead, if you were to remove Ruby bleeding out of her crotch Mm -hmm. and the eyeball, you'd kind of mostly just have a bunch of models scowling at each other for an hour and a half. Right, right? yeah, you'd have a murder movie. Just just like a pretty typical, like... Someone got shoved. Jealousy sort of thing. Um, And then you just mentioned Ruby. Uh, In between her leaving the photo shoot and going to the club, she's introduced to a makeup artist named Ruby, who's played by Jenna Malone. And Ruby from The Jump, you know, her name is Ruby. She's dressed in red. She has red hair. But she is very, very friendly to Jesse. When she meets her, she has this very creepy kind of long stare. And she's like, oh you just have the most beautiful skin. I'm sorry, am I staring? And then Elle, who's like a babe in the woods, or or at least appears to be a babe in the woods, is a little sheepish and kind of doesn't know what to make of this attention, or at least she pretends that she doesn't know what to make of this attention. And then, and th- this is kind of something I was thinking that, that might be a bit of a stretch, but Jenna Malone's character, Ruby, like cleans the blood off of her a little bit, and which is so, almost like her birth, like she's been initiated into this world modeling because that's really she's on her very first photo shoot at that moment and then you know then then she disappears into this nightclub to meet up with two of ruby's i wouldn't call them frenemies they seem to be her actually her actual friends are these two other her coven her coven (laughs) yeah her two these two other models uh Gigi and abby lee who's a an australian model plays sarah and then uh, Bella Heathcote, who is an actress, plays Gigi. And the, the three of them together, Ruby, Gigi, and Sarah, are said by the director to represent three forms of beauty, where Ruby represents internal beauty, Gigi represents manufactured beauty because she has all this plastic surgery done, and then Abby Lee's character, Sarah, represents beauty past its prime. So there's a scene later in the movie where where Abby Lee's character describes herself as a ghost and she's you know the whole idea is that she's past 19. You know, and she gets passed over. She gets passed over by the younger model, which is, you know, important later on in the film. And this whole idea of like you have this like really really early expiration date is kind of interesting to me because Reffens talked about how he wanted to revive the Logan's Run franchise. You know, which is all about, like, when you turn 30, you're recycled and, you know, you die. So it's interesting that it's even mentioned several times in the film, like, people have expiration dates. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also interesting the way Riffin sets out those three characters, because although those are just sort of these flat archetypes, Mm -hmm. and they're performed so flatly, which we can get into later. flatly, But they're sort of actually these very interesting characters, Mm -hmm. like the, the... there's such an economy of dialogue, mm-hmm. but I think you really get a sense of these characters as characters, even though they're these flat archetypes. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's just my impression. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. Like, you don't you see Jenna Malone in a lot of movies, and she's like, kind of like a a, a quirky, weird, semi gothy girl in a lot of her movies. You know, she's in Sucker Punch, and I re- I really loved her character in Sucker Punch. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Because she was, like, the only one that seemed to have, like, any any pizzazz. The rest of them were just coat hangers in that movie. And that was a movie I had a lot of hope for, but it was just fucking terrible. I totally agree. However, yeah. I think there's something about this film that's like Sucker Punch. Mm-hmm. And that's just, and I'm going to jump way ahead in the film, that there's this something about Jessie. She has that thing. Everybody's staring at mm-hmm. her. And I think that something that's really interesting about The Neon Demon is about the subjectivity of beauty. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that it calls that up is everybody in the film is so smitten by her, Mm -hmm. especially the designer who, like, is completely transfixed by her and everybody's bending over backwards to articulate how beautiful she is. Yeah, he, like, practically, like, bites his knuckle. And I'm like, oh, (laughs) my God. Uh, It's so, it's such a corny scene. It is, but, but what I think is interesting is... Is she more beautiful than any of the other women in the room? So this and is so, and that's not even about like to me. It's just that's a stupid question. That here's what it reminds me of. Have you ever seen the Monty Python skit? It reminds me of Sucker Punch, and it reminds me of the Monty Python skit, the funniest joke in the world. Have you I, seen that I haven't skit? seen that skit. Okay, no. basically, this guy writes this joke, 
and he reads it to himself and he laughs himself to death. And then his wife oh, discovers his body, yeah, picks yeah, up yeah. the joke, laughs herself to death. And it becomes used as a tool of war. They translate it word by word into German and read it to the German army. And and they're like running over trenches, reading it out loud. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So part of the skit is you never hear the joke, right? Yeah. You never know what the thing is. And with Sucker Punch, every time she starts to dance... They just fade away and you never see what mm -hmm. she actually does to create these other realms for these men or whatever is happening. It's a terrible movie. So with the Neon Demon, mm -hmm. everybody's so transfixed by her, but why? What does she have? Right. What's actually going on? And it opens up a conversation about the subjectivity of beauty, but it's almost in this film, it's almost supernatural what's happening with her. Yeah. So she has this thing that is not just she's the prettiest girl in the room, mm -hmm. which is stupid. She has something more than that. Yeah, I, I think she has the director's eye, is what I would say. <laughs> because, you know, this is an interesting way to go into this, I think, but, like, of the four women, who do you personally think is the hottest? I don't know. I don't... I think they're... Well, the two blonde ones. Mm -hmm. I think something that's interesting about choosing them as actresses is that they are models and they reveal the sort of abject nature of watching those bodies mm -hmm. emote and i'm not criticizing those women or those bodies i'm just saying like we are so inured to what a model's body always looks like mm -hmm. in our culture yeah and okay so this moves us a little further into the movie a little bit but um something that happens in the background is I think we're used to seeing women who look like that completely still in or editorial photos, right. or, or at the very least moving linearly down a catwalk. And so to see them talk and move around is pretty interesting. I mean, the only time you ever see any of the other ones is uh, Abby Lee is in Fury Road. She's one of uh, yes. Morton Joe's brides. And even then, she's just kind of the same thing. She's basically standing there looking beautiful in the desert. You know, she's part of the set piece. Uh, but you see there's a scene where there is a mountain lion that enters into Jessie's room, this hotel room that she's staying in, in a, a, in a hotel, or a motel rather, that's owned by Keanu Reeves' character, and easily one of his like worst roles ever. Like I, I think Keanu Reeves is just absolutely terrible in this. But as the movie moves on to the mansion that they're all staying in near the end, there are all these taxidermy cats like in the background that are just this like primal beauty that's just been frozen. And it's almost like there's the weird reversal, like as they become more animated and more crazy, there are these frozen exotic animals in the background of every scene. Well, I think that's also paralleled by Ruby fucking that corpse. Yep. It's like she's in this moment of passion with this model who has no inner depth and her substitute for that flat, lifeless model is a corpse. Yeah. Yeah, and you know that that scene is the one that I think everybody really talks about, other than the final scene with the eyeball. But you know, you have this very odd scene where Ruby's character, who she's a, she's a high fashion makeup artist, but she is also a uh, mortician's assistant makeup artist. So she's working on dead people and live people, uh, which I'm sure there's something you could say about that, but I don't want to. But. I really want to talk more about the experience of watching this like scene of necrophilia. And also in interviews, Refn talks about how he he films everything chronologically, which is crazy. I don't think anybody else does that except for like little kids. It, like that's how when I made movies with my friends, that's how I always made movies. <laughs> and the scripts are also very light and, and open to rewrites. And he talks about in interviews that there was a scene where... After the scene happened, he really nailed the character that was in the scene, and it changed the entire rest of the movie. And I believe it's that scene, because it, he never really describes which scene it is, but in another interview, he talks about how originally that scene was written where she just bends over and kisses the character on the lips. Yep. And then he's like, well, could you maybe like spit in the, the mouth of the corpse? And you know then it becomes this really and malone just like went for it it was improvised it. yeah 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 and and i think she's really like this is something i think that Refn does it's kind of like a trick and he does i think he does it again with jesse's beauty which is that is a beautiful girl in corpse makeup and then there's like a beautiful girl making out with her so on one level you're sort of creeped out that she's like making out and like masturbating over a dead body 
but it's also kind of like a sexy lesbian scene too like from like a you know i'm like a pretty average dude looking at it i you know so in your brain you're like oh these girls are attractive but one of them's supposed to be dead and so i think the real like creepiness from that scene comes from that push and pull or the allure and the repulsion of the act well i think that very act aside from being i think actually like I don't know. I think it's the most interesting part of the movie, honestly, Mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. But I think it also bridges this movie more concretely with a lot of other uh, films that led up to it, like the the lesbian vampire Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) subgenre of horror films in the late 60s and early 70s, like Daughters of Darkness and Jose LaRaza's Vampires and The Hunger, for sure, is it takes this sort of vampiric, this film that's all about the predatory nature Mm -hmm. of stalking beauty and literalizes the sort of vampire angle about sex and death. Yeah. And, you know, something I've observed that I wasn't really super knowledgeable of just doing our Instagram page and this kind of weird one is when you just go through like hashtag horror or hashtag horror girl or any of the things that you're just like, if you're trying to push your social media brand that you might troll through uh, looking for hashtags, there is an enormous amount of alt models that are dressed up like murder victims or murders or whatever. So there's this entire like subgenre of sexy corpses. And I think if you've looked at enough of that stuff, like maybe you're a genre fan and your friends, you know, your fans of like these girls online and stuff like that, like maybe you do have like a heightened level of erotic drive towards a scene like that, which I think is is kind of weird, maybe new. I, I don't know. It's not new. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it also, in that way, reminds me a lot of... Um, are you familiar with the band Adult? Mm-mm. They came up very much in the Electro Clash moment. They were pre-Electro Clash, but um, were definitely part of that minimal electronic with female vocals scene. And all of the album art were photographs done by uh, the vocalist, Nicola Kuperus. And they are all pretty much women's bodies head out of frame, very stark, often dead, like kind of like half hidden behind a hotel bed or legs sticking out a doorway or, and it's sort of almost the template for this fucking movie, but also them being this minimal electronic music that was very, Mm -hmm. uh, sort of had an explosive moment in, um, around the early aughts and taking a lot of cues from the eighties, I think just the aesthetic of Electro Clash mm-hmm. in the 80s just runs right through this film very heavily. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely another one of those like auteur 80s horror movies. I mean, I, I still haven't seen if there's a formal taxonomy for this genre. Well, I really want to talk about this because yeah. I've been thinking a lot about it. I'm sort of sticking with thinking about these films that we've been discussing and ones we haven't even touched yet as being aesthetic horror Mm -hmm. and i'm using the word aesthetic sort of the way one uses the word modern there's there's the word modern like current and capital m modern means modernism it's sort of you know there's a there's a disruption there and i think that aesthetic there's lowercase e aesthetic and then there is more recently capital e aesthetic which applies to like vaporwave and Mm -hmm. all the instagram and tumblr blogs that come out of the whole vaporwave movement that's very much about aesthetic right, right. Um, that are so much about surface that there's actually something very deep happening. But it seems that you were sort of going for like either auteur horror or mm-hmm. synth horror. Yeah. You know, like I, I want, well, the two main reasons is synth horror just seemed to be kind of like a cool <clears throat> sounding name for me. But then oh, I, sure. I started thinking more about like the idea of auteur horror. Um, I don't want to necessarily imply that all of these directors are are auteurs, although I think you, if you're generous, you could probably give this title to uh, Refn and the guy that directed The Witch or It Follows. And if anything, they're, uh, they're educated in, in a particular style of filmmaking that I think is very like Kubrickian, uh, very, um, you know, Paul Schrader, like that sort of stylized horror movie. And... You know, the, one of the reasons why I'm sort of resistant to that is like, okay, or other horror movies that don't have synth soundtracks, non-auteur, you know, like, is there not, or like, is, um, you know, Kevin Smith not an auteur? 
because of Tusk. Well, yeah. I think I think the bigger uh, <laughs> for me, no, totally, no, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, another question that I put on that whole thing is like, when has anybody ever called a, a female filmmaker an auteur? So, as far as mm-hmm. like, when do we apply this moniker? It's like, well, we don't really apply it to women. Why? We don't sure. really apply it to Kevin Smith. Why? We don't. Eh, often applied to black think, filmmakers, I don't except think, for Spike Lee and, and I Tyler Perry. I don't think I'd give it to Spike Lee, and I don't think I'd give it to Kevin Smith at really? all. You know, Kevin Smith, like, the camera just doesn't move. And I think an interesting camera movement is, is is just a necessary requirement of being considered an auteur filmmaker. I mean, I love Kevin Smith's movies. I, I thought Tusk was pretty badass. I mean, I, I took my wife in to see that movie cold. Like, she had no expectation of it. She didn't know anything about it. Um... And it's just so absurd and so just aggressively bad in all the right ways. Like, I think people will watch that movie at midnight showings in the future. I, I, I think it's so endearingly wacky and weird. I also think it's his best looking movie. And the reason why is because he he says it himself is he just went and watched every Kubrick movie and came back and ripped off all, ripped off everything he could. And, you know, so another way of describing these films is Kubrickian kitsch which yeah. is something I, I saw some film reviewer refer to It Follows as that. And I, I think I like Kubrickian kitsch more than my own... It's kind uh, of a mouthful. Yeah. But, but I think that the, I mean, the history of the expression auteur mm-hmm. uh, and the auteur theory came from Andrew Saris, who, and I'm just going to read a quote from the article where he really broke out with this concept in 62, where he said, quote, the first premise of the auteur theory is the technical competence of the director as a criterion of value. The second premise of the auteur theory is the distinguishable personality of the director as a criterion of value. Mm -hmm. The third and ultimate premise of the auteur theory is concerned with the interior meaning, the ultimate glory of cinema as an art. Interior meaning is extrapolated from the tension between the director's personality and his material. And Okay, so this theory, do you think that, especially the second point there, Hmm. do you think... A good personality is a requirement. <laughs> you mean because Riffin comes off like an asshole? <laughs> I mean, not even an asshole, I'm but I mean, I, yeah, totally. I know what you're saying. Like, I mean, if you look at any interview with Riffin, like any uh, video interview, and you look on YouTube, yeah. I mean, people are not having it. They're, well, I mean, I got to be honest. You sent me a link to this one interview where while I was watching it, I was just like, I had a very, I was just like, wow, I really want to punch this guy in the fucking teeth. Yeah. But then, like, after it was over and I was thinking about it later, I was like, you know, I really wanted to punch him in the teeth. That's awesome. <laughs> like, yeah. I kind of really respected how much of a reaction he got out of me just by talking about his films in a really difficult affect. Yeah. Okay, so this moves us into the territory of movies that have very uh, mixed reviews and not just like, oh, my friend liked it, my other friend didn't like it. So at Cannes, this movie, half the audience booed, half the audience cheered. Yeah, I think it's pretty important to know which half cheered personally, <laughs> but you never really find that out. Like if every goon that was there was like, mm, this is awesome, then like, it doesn't really pass. But you know, the, the idea is that some people really love this movie, some people really hated this movie, and he wears that as a badge of pride which i think is kind of a cheat where you're like okay well the sign of every single great movie is that some people loved it and some people hated it or every endear- enduring movie is that some people loved it and it was maybe hated at the time and i think sometimes half the crowd can just hate something and it doesn't necessarily imply uh, a genius mm-hmm. which which is what he seems to to be on about here I think part of the idea of the, the, the auteur filmmaker or the idea of the auteur in that theory is also like a person's taste, like you're asserting a type of taste. And, you know, I really love hear, I love hearing directors now, this seems very popular now, people seem to be very open with talking about their influences and what films they saw. Yeah. And it, it seems to be a very new phenomenon that that directors go on this like really major, like they're on podcasts or on YouTube channels, <clears throat> all the new movies you can really hear a lot about the film from the actual filmmaker, which is one of the reasons why I've been so interested in directors now. I was always, as a writer, always really driven by story. That was always a thing that was really important to me. Or, you know, the whatever the director of photography did, or even tertiary, 
the soundtrack was always something to me. And I could almost never, I almost never gave a shit at all about a director. But now it, it seems to th- be the thing that I'm focusing on the most in reviewing these films. Well, I think it's also interesting that this movement, moment, this moment is happening when it is because, uh, you know, those those three criteria that I read from mm-hmm. uh, Andrew Saris, they all apply to at least the three of the four movies we've discussed in this podcast so yeah. far. And it's also interesting that it's, you know, like, this is not a Foucauldian way to think about film. It's not a Bartian way to think about film, you know, getting swept up in the cult of the author, mm-hmm. um, this sort of wielding of patriarchal power over over narrative, over product. Um, it's just so not of this moment mm-hmm. that I find super fascinating. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, another something that's strange about film to me too is how much of like a group dynamic it is. I mean, a, a, a film film to me is the ultimate collaborative art form because you have to have you have to have the actors, you have to have the whoever wrote the thing, you have to have the director. Yeah, there's like a hundred fucking people who are making creative decisions. Yeah. We're not even talking about craft services. Yeah. There are like a hundred people like being creative, being artists, just yeah. to make the Neon Demon, which is a small crew and cast. Pretty film. small crew, and. You know, and also, uh, you know, one of the ways that Refn has talked about maintaining control of his films is working with really small budgets, which, you know, this budget was seven million dollars, and which is pretty small for a it major is. major movie. And I think, unlike in The Witch, you can really feel the 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 seven million dollars it being pretty tight in this movie. There there's certain things, for instance, I think that the the costuming is not super amazing in this movie. Uh, for a movie that's supposed to be about the high fashion world of high couture, I don't think the costumes are any more convincing to that world than the ones in Zoolander are. Right. You know, and I, I, I did read a few interviews with the lady who did the costume design, and I'm sure she's phenomenal. But, you know, like compare the, I would say, legitimately striking bluish aqua dress that Jesse wears at the end of the film to anything in Black Swan. You know, I mean, pretty much anybody, even... Even like walk-in characters in that movie look better, I think, than some of the, the the stuff that's supposed to be on the catwalk here. But in some ways, it can kind of work out a little bit because the the salary he offers this director of photography is three thousand dollars a week, which doesn't seem like a small amount, but to some like me, it seems like a large amount. But in that world, it's actually pretty small. So he ends up getting kind of a pretty like a unknown woman named Natasha Breyer to be his his director of photography, and I thought she did a really great job in this movie like one of the things that i think everyone says about this movie is how great it looks and you know she she wanted to shoot on film and he didn't want to shoot on film because he can't do his chronological shooting like that and so natasha buyer you know her concern was that the digital camera was going to reveal too much of the imperfections of the model's faces and she really wanted this sort of 1960s glamour thing so they they literally took 60s lenses and married them to these digital cameras, which I think had a really neat effect. And I, I can't imagine that people don't already do that, that that's not a thing that people do. Because um, I, I was a, a film major for one semester when I was 17 before I dropped out of college the first time. And we did everything on film. And it's such a pain in the dick. I can't even imagine, given like how I think really good digital is now, that anybody shooting a low-budget movie like this would want to burn up money like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think she really captured like a lot of like neat magic in, in like these these models. But I, I want to get back to a question I asked before, which I don't think you quite dodged, but I don't think you quite answered. Like, like, fuck, Mary kill. Which one of these girls are you? Are you I, don't, I, I don't like that game. It's terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible game. Well, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to I'm going to dodge again, but with uh, I'm going to respond and still dodge. Um, I think there is nothing sexually interesting to me about a 16 year old girl. Okay. So this is where I want to go with this. And like, that's, I think, I I wonder if where I'm about to go is where you want to go, which is just, I think so much of this movie is also about that. Mm -hmm. This like predator, prey, beauty, innocence, Mm -hmm. 16 year old girl, 
alone in Los Angeles mm-hmm. as the object of, quote, perfect beauty yeah. is just fucked up by any standard. Yeah. And this, but this is an old story. You know, this is not, the, I mean, this is definitely uh, a story that any viewer would be familiar with. And I think if there's um, a social critique that he's making, it's it's about that. It's about that. Hey, look, this terrible machine, this this neon demon of Los Angeles, the fashion world, it chews up young women, and in this movie, literally chews up young women. Um, but you know, a whole lot is made about her age in this movie, and I think it becomes this moral test for each character. Each character has this bizarre. Um, everybody once they find out how old she is, they have to make a choice of how to deal with her age. So very early on, you have uh, her pseudo boyfriend in the Trans Am that's the photographer. You know, he is up there, they're having this really beautiful moment, like looking out on Los Angeles with the moon and total fullness is over above them. And he's looking at her and, and she says that line, like, I always imagined the moon was a big eye looking down on me, which I think is important for later in the film when the moon is looking down and there's an eye. Um, which I don't know why we're like tiptoeing around it. This is like a total spoiler show. So he finds out that she's 16 years old and he's like sitting there and he's like, oh man, he's like, I think I gotta go. Like kind of joking, like he he makes, he acknowledges that, you know, he was interested, but now he knows he's not supposed to be interested. But when he goes and drops her off, he goes to kiss her and she pulls away. And, you know, because of she's, at, at least as far as we know, like a virgin. That, that's that's revealed later in the movie. Um, but so he kind of fails the test and he's sort of the most, he's supposed to represent like the every man in this film, like some, the average person who would be there. And even he's tempted by her beauty. And then uh, Christina Hendricks's character, who is the, uh, the agent uh, or the agency head who's in charge of casting all these girls, she discovers how old she is and she's like well what about high school and she's like oh i'm still kind of working on that and she says okay you tell everybody you're 19 and here's a parental consent form just go sign it have them sign it and so she basically makes this uh financial decision to look past her being 16 which is a different sort of deal and then later in the movie basically everybody wants to possess her in some sexual manner the one person who i think well keanu's keanu's character even is referring to the girl down the hall. Yeah. Some yeah. real Lolita shit. Some real hard 13. candy. Yeah. Some real, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so obviously 16, not a problem. Yeah. 16, not a problem. He's probably seen it before. And then I, you know, I just want to do what Refn does in this movie and just sort of dispense with the male characters kind of pretty quickly. I don't know that it needs to be said, but Keanu Reeves is absolutely terrible in this movie. He's completely unbelievable as this character. He's as stiff as he was in Dracula. And I think he's too famous to be in this role. Like he plays, like you're immediately like, oh, there's Keanu. And that's one of the problems I think with these like big A-list celebrities. It's very hard for them to to disappear into characters unless they're they're very talented, like somebody like Daniel Day-Lewis or something like that. Uh, And I, I just... His presence isn't doing any work in this film. However, however, it seems to me that the only moment of dialogue that even comes close to natural is between the kind of boyfriend photographer and Keanu's character. Mm-hmm. It's stilted because it's Keanu, mm-hmm. but every conversation, all verbal interactions in this film, there's endless pauses everything's awkward and tense it's really uncomfortable and pregnant or Mm -hmm. not depending on whether you like this movie or not right but when they confront each other they're just talking right and they talk kind of quickly and it's Mm -hmm. there's like a there's a back and forth that doesn't exist in the rest of the film at all and i is it the only time two men talk when women aren't around well well, not when women aren't around, because the boyfriend later on talks with the fashion director in the in the in the restaurant scene. But the but, but the women aren't the women there, are there present. Yeah, all all the girls, um, except for Jenna Malone's character. But you know, in that scene where he's where uh, the young photographer is talking to Keanu Reeves' character, there is a bit of an exchange, which is not. Uh, he kind of discusses the transactional role or the transactional nature of their relationship. He's like, hey, you just gave me 140 bucks to cover the damage 
that this girl caused to the room by leaving the window open, allowing a mountain lion to come in and tear it up. I hope you're getting something out of this. And in that moment, I think Keanu Reeves, his star power does one small job, which is he's, he's standing in for Los Angeles. Like he's representing Los Angeles in that moment. And he's saying, I hope you got this role. And then this mm. is, you know, he's like, he's like, I hope you got something out of this. And if you didn't, by the way, two doors down or one door down, actually, there's this other girl who's 13 years old. And then he, I mean, who knows what his motivation is for that. And then I think later on, there's that really terrifying, uh, what you're left to imagine is a rape scene. They make it seem a little bit like it's Keanu, but it could also be that boyfriend coming back because we know that Keanu is okay with kicking down a door because it's his motel and he's kicked he had his like lackey kick it down oh, before so there's this yeah. weird weird moment where it's like you don't really know who's committing this horrible crime next to her yes. but i'd like to come back to that scene a little bit and go back to uh the the men in this movie for a moment i think the one character in the show in this movie that sort of does act not morally but amorally like he doesn't make a misstep is or maybe he does, which is the photographer, the guy who initially shoots her, Jack. Uh, he he doesn't know she's 16. The whole time he's interacting with her, he's under the illusion that she's 19 years old because everybody else who's like been a gatekeeper for her brings her there and like, he, you know, here she is. She is 19 years old. And he maybe believes it, maybe doesn't believe it, but he seems like such a mechanism and like such maybe a, like a mildly autistic but aggressive photographer you know like artist that you know i think that all he ever really does is photograph her and he doesn't ever really misstep and his job is to make her beautiful in the context of this and his other job and the thing that he does for her is he's the one who makes it possible for her to advance forward you know he gives her her career i mean he literally covers her in gold he gives her her value in the photo shoot he's like smearing this gold paint over her and photographs her and those photographs are the ones that allow her to get the next role which causes all of her problems advance one level yeah although i think there is maybe another way to look at it which this goes back to what i was saying about like with this thing that she has mm -hmm. that is almost supernatural is well she says early in the film that her mother used to say that she was dangerous i mm -hmm. can't remember what i think that was the word she used. Yeah. And um, she seems to be the prey mm -hmm. the entire movie, but she's totally actually untouchable. Mm -hmm. She actually controls everyone. Yeah. Until she doesn't. Right. Um, <laughs> but um, so on one hand, we can think of it that he advances her career. Right. But you could also look at it as he was actually powerless mm -hmm. for what she brought. I mean, she just... I mean, it's kind of a showgirl's narrative, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, she yeah. just kind of like walks into town and owns everything. Mm -hmm. So she walks into town, owns everything. So the first time I saw this movie, I was very high. And I just totally fell in love with it. And I really bought her as this beautiful character, this 16-year-old character that is like ethereal, uh, otherworldly maybe, uh, maybe some sort of like goddess. Like I think the attention to the moon sort of implies that a little bit. Her Her mermaid hair everything about her is like kind of built up to be sort of otherworldly um the second time you watch this movie after there's the reveal at the end where she's like my mother called me dangerous and she has this this really short monologue about what's wrong with being this beautiful everyone would want to be like this you know and one way of looking at that is like she's just born that way she's like a, a she's a freak she's a weird quirk of nature and what else would you expect of her? And then Refn has, I think, a very peculiar but thing to say about the way young people are navigating narcissism in the world is he he says in one interview that he considers himself to be a director from the future, which is probably, I think, maybe the interview I sent you and you're like, oh, this fucking guy, <laughs> uh, which I totally agree. Like When he says that, I'm like, man, what a twat. But... I also think he's kind of right because he is making a movie where narcissism becomes a virtue where and he he posits that that all young people are beginning to see the world like that where where why what's wrong with being beautiful 
it's so fleeting, it's so small, it's so short. Why wouldn't you be as beautiful or as possible and accept it for this brief moment in time? Well, I think that that in the narrative all hinges on her runway show, mm -hmm. which she in the I'll just divide it into halves. Sure. The first half of the movie, she's all demure and innocent mm -hmm. and is always looking down and, and deferential. And then she does the runway, which is basically a bunch of mirrors of her, you know, it's her narcissist mm. moment where, yeah. she, you know, she looks at her reflection and falls in love. I mean, she literally kisses it. And she literally kisses yeah. it. And then the very next time you see her, she's all dolled up, like kind of Studio 54 style. Mm -hmm. I think it might be the first time we see her in makeup that she's probably done herself. Yep. If I'm going on a limb there. But she like walks through this beaded curtain and greets her non-boyfriend mm -hmm. who she ditches within minutes. Minutes, yeah. And it's like from that point on she transforms into the demon. Like that's that was her that was her transformative yeah. moment. Well, I I definitely want to go right into that that scene in the restaurant. But before that, I want to maybe say something and see what you think about it is when I watch this movie the second time, she ceases to be a sympathetic character because you know from the jump, from the very beginning, that she is actually what she becomes. Like, you just know she is. And you, in the, the, the scene where she talks about, like, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, I don't know how to sing, I don't know how to do this, but I'm, but I'm pretty. pretty. And, and pretty seems like a very, like, juvenile way of describing what she actually is, or at least what she's supposed to be in the movie. Yeah. And, and she's like, and pretty can make me money, is what she says. Yes. Which is really unusual because, like, finance doesn't appear anywhere else in this movie. Like, mm -hmm. it's completely absent. Like, the money is never a motivation. I mean, you think the moment she signed at an agency, she wouldn't have to live in a motel anymore. I mean, so who knows, right? Like, that that's just a weird thing that happens in the movie. Yeah, so I think there is a transformation that happens in the movie during the runway show. And part of it is, like, oh, okay, that's when she changes. But I think that's when she becomes. And so she becomes this character. She dispenses with her flowery children's dresses and shows up in leather pants and gold top and enters the restaurant. Yeah. So I think there's a way in which there's almost a third way to think of her character. Mm -hmm. There's like the victim monster. But I almost feel like if this movie was made by Aronofsky... Mm -hmm. And we could look at it up against like the wrestler and Black mm -hmm. Swan. That we're talking about a character who died for beauty, who like took the gifts she was given as far as they could go, and it was Narcissus by way of Icarus. Mm -hmm. Like in the wrestler, like in Black Swan, they had to sacrifice themselves as the highest form of art or right. the highest form of art necessitated that they would sacrifice themselves. And that's kind of what happens in the neon demon. Maybe yeah. not. Well, tell me what you think about this is like, I think maybe the difference between the Aronofsky model of her exceptionalism is that she's just born that way in this movie. She's just a creature that emerges beautiful like that. And I think the, the characters in black Swan and the wrestler, uh, they have been ruined by a path. Right. And yes, you know, so maybe if this movie had a longer timeline, it, it, it kind of went more along, like maybe, maybe you could say that. I mean, I'm not saying that's not a thing. I, I just think that maybe it's just that the characters just aren't very well developed because I think they are pretty flat through it. And I think her character is too. You know, something else to think about is when you mentioned a second ago, is she a monster? Is she actually a monster? And one of the things that I think really accentuates that is because she's 16, you never see her naked. You see everybody else in the movie naked. Yeah. And I think this does a trick that you see with monsters in horror movies, which is like if you never fully see the monster, you're forced to imagine the monster and you imagine the monster more horrifying than the effects department probably could have done it. And I think in this film, you imagine her as more beautiful than she may be i mean I, she's gorgeous right but and here's the thing that i think is the nasty trick that refn plays is that he's forcing you to imagine her naked and she's 16 and you or at least i failed 
the moral charge of that because I completely imagined her naked in that gold paint. And, you know, so like there you are, you're in with everybody else who's guilty in this movie. Like you've, you've fallen for the same trick. Well, it's sort of like uh, Louis C.K.'s thing. I think it's his. This about is exactly the, about, what I was going to talk N-word. about. Yeah. Like, well, you say the N-word. Now I'm saying it in my head. Yes. Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that that's exactly what's happening with that. And, you know, and who knows? Like you can't film her naked. Like I wonder if she had been actually 19 years old in real life if he would have shot her differently if she would have been naked in the film or something like that but even still like her runway walk let's Mm -hmm. say that totally smites the fashion designer we don't see her walk yeah you don't see it not really we totally see uh uh the other model yeah well abby lee is a legit supermodel sure yeah and so, you know, when the, earlier, I keep trying to get you to go back to this play, which one you think is the hottest. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm already <laughs> thinking of another Dodge. So. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> well, I'm just going to like throw it out there. I'll show you mine. Um, I think Abby Lee is the most beautiful person in this movie, like physically beautiful. However, the person who I'm most attracted to is Jenna Malone. Well, she's just rad. Yeah. She's, a, she's an interesting character. And she's an interesting person and it's hard to not take that. Right. Uh, out of the movie. You know, like, she she's has, pretty cool. Yeah, she has a cool, quirky band. She's kind of like an, you know, an L.A. hipster actress. I mean, there, there's something cool about her. Uh, she looks a little like Willow from Buffy. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> I think I was definitely thinking about that. She has tattoos. She's also the only of the women who has any sort of discernible skill. Like, she actually can do something. She she can apply the makeup. And yeah. she can... She can uh, basically perform a glamour on herself and others. So she can make the other person even more beautiful and, and she can make herself beautiful enough to hang with these models, at least under a strobe light in a nightclub. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I think what I love about this movie is maybe what a lot of people hate, which is everything is so open-ended. Mm-hmm. There are no answers. They're mostly just questions. Yep. I, you get the feeling that Refn was mostly riffing mm-hmm. on a lot of it. Like the fact that the necrophilia scene was improvised yeah. completely changes the movie. Right. And it came up at the last second, which is awesome. I, I think that our desire for everything to be worked out in advance is yeah. just preposterous. It Like, why can't filmmaking be slightly improvisational? Right. But I think that this film is pretty messy. So it just kind of throws out a lot of these signifiers and... It leaves you with a question at the end. It's like, I, I don't even know where to begin with the questions. Are these women vampires? Why did they eat her body exactly? J- Ruby, like, what was coming out of her hoo-hoo when she was under the moonlight? Like, yeah, yeah. what the fuck was happening? What is the main character's power over everybody? The cat? You know, I think it's hard not to refer to other reviews, but a lot of negative reviews just sort of like these were complaints that they had about the movie. But it's sort of what I loved about it is that I don't know what the hell it was going on. Yeah, I mean, like definitely like the dudes over at at Double Toasted uh, who I love and you you guys have to go watch Double Toasted on YouTube. You can listen to it too. Yeah, you can listen to it. I mean, they're just really funny, very smart. Uh, I I just like their take on it. I mean, definitely they are really like what hanging out with your absolute smartest funny friends and talking about a movie and they don't just stick on horror they hit everything so any blockbuster you happen to be thinking about um, or pop song or news event song or anything <laughs> uh their review of uh luke cage is phenomenal oh yeah they just have a great great take on it it's really interesting but i think there's evidence that uh, the lack of meaning is intentional in this film uh because in interviews uh Refn talks about how inspired and influenced he was by Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which he specifically says is a movie that has no meaning in the horror and, and grotesquerie of that film is never justified in it. And I think that he for sure probably had that vibe in mind. Uh, it's one of the movies he made, the DP, Natasha Breyer, he made Natasha Breyer watch that movie and then other movies you might expect, like uh, Rosemary's Baby, Valley of the Dolls was one of them, Scorpio Rising and, he, and Clockwork Orange, which... I think, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, I guess you could see some of those things in this movie, uh, particularly the switch from blue to red tonally, I think is something you see in Rosemary's Baby, especially at the very end. But it definitely, you know, it goes off the rails at the end and doesn't seem to have any desire to to help you get back on it or or, or understand why. And I think that mostly what this movie is, I think it's a little bit medium is the message. I think it's Mm -hmm. more tone than anything else. I think that it 
sort of tells you a story and gives some sort of vague message about beauty mm -hmm. that you can read very many ways, but it is that thing as mm -hmm. well. It is an incredibly shallow film. It's yeah. shot incredibly shallowly where everything is so hyper aestheticized. Mm -hmm. There's so little depth to the characters. Right. It's sort of so willfully surface that it is revealing about its subject matter in a really yeah. resonant way. So, you know, you talk about like the, the extremism of it and the look, you know, one of the stories about Refn is that he is colorblind and that yeah. he can only see these extremes and colors. And that's why he hires these DPs and he, he makes them shoot them in extremes so he can see the film. He may be colorblind, but I'm calling bullshit on that. Sure. Because I mean, when you listen to Beethoven, Beethoven's deaf, at after most for most of his life it's not like he's making this crazy crashing quiet loud quiet loud music and also you would think that you would hire a dp and just expect it to look good you know it, it's like it's a limitation but at the same time maybe he's enforcing his limitation and like really like not only is he in Forcing his vision in the world, he's literally enforcing his vision on the world. Right. I mean, you know? I think either way, it's a good story. It's a good story. Yeah. Uh, what have you seen? I just watched it yesterday. Have you seen Only God Forgives? Man, I didn't get twenty minutes into that it movie is a before. Fucking I gave it up. terrible it's movie. Terrible. I don't know a single person who watched it all the way through, and you know, I, I feel like. You know, I adopted this Oprah Winfrey rule a while back about all media, which is she says if a book doesn't grab her after 100 pages, she just ditches it. And I used to be a completist. I would just stick through any piece of shit all the way through yeah. just because I wanted to be able to, like, if I didn't like it, I would have an opinion on about it. But, you know, I just turned Only only God Forgives Off. And I, a movie that I really wanted to watch was his wife's documentary about him making that movie. Right. Because it's I wanted gotta be to be better. Well, you know, in the way that, like, um, I think Apocalypse Heart Now is illuminated by Heart of Darkness. Yeah. And I feel like after I saw, I saw Apocalypse Now probably when I was a teenager, and I saw Heart of Darkness a little bit later, uh, probably when I was, like, maybe 19, or, yeah. or I was still a teenager, but 20. Yeah. Um, and then I went back, and I had a way deeper appreciation for what a Apocalypse Now was. And I'm wondering if a similar thing might happen if I go watch this documentary about him making this movie. Then because you're just investing more time in a shitty movie, that's right? That's the thing. I mean, you're so deep and there's so many good movies. It's like, what, am I, I really think committed? I think looking at Drive, Only God Forgives, um, Valhalla Rising, which I loved, mm -hmm. they're really similar movies in pacing, in having characters right up front, extreme symmetry. Mm -hmm. Dialogue doesn't really... Like, Valhalla Rising has no dialogue. Right. Uh, drive, strong, silent type. And yep. even the characters around him don't say that much necessarily. Yeah. Um, or it's often this sort of peripheral noise. And I think that his aesthetic really coalesces in this film, mm -hmm. where he's so much about the plastic value of the set is equal to soundtrack, is equal to the actors, is equal mm -hmm. to the script, yeah. is equal to the cinematography. And... In a film that is about modeling mm -hmm. and the shallowness of modeling, again, it just all sort of coalesces really resonantly. Yeah. And I, one thing I really appreciate about him with this movie is that he just keeps talking about how intentionally shallow it is. You know, he's like, hey, look, this movie, like, go ahead, read into it what you want. Imagine the women as witches or whatever you want to do. But... I'm telling you, and I made the movie that this movie is basically about a, a woman coming to Hollywood and getting killed after being super beautiful. You know, interesting. Uh, again, I don't know that I like super buy it because this really reminds me of uh, Brett Easton Ellis whenever he's talking about uh, the canyons, which is his the movie that he wrote that Lindsay Lohan is in with uh, the porn star, porn star James Dean. So he wrote this movie. And he always has this out where he's like, hey, look, this is a good movie. Everybody I know hated it. It was like pretty panned by critics. And one of the things he always is kind of defensive is like, hey, this is just was supposed to be a little movie. So when he's asserting the fact that there's nothing to see here, it's like that, that Maya Angelou quote, right? Like you have to kind of take somebody at their word the first time. And, you know, I guess I guess I'm going to take him at his word. And by taking him at his word, I enjoyed the film more, which... 
you know, I don't, I don't know if that would be a common experience. Like, did you, you enjoyed the film, right? You liked Neon it. Neon Demon? Yeah. Totally into it. Totally, yeah. I mean, I, it, I wouldn't rec- go around recommending it to everybody. Yeah. But I gladly watched it a second and third time. Mm-hmm. It's a movie that I found that the women in my life have really responded to favorably. Hmm. Um, I, I find that the people, like guys who watch it are kind of like, yeah, it's some art house bullshit. Um, women seem to be very into it. I don't want to generalize that, but like I work around mostly women um, and, and they've all seen the movie and they were all like super into it. And most of them aren't like really horror fans. You know, they're sort of bought into it because of the director. Like they love Drive, they love, you know, basically they love Drive. And then this movie. And I, I think that that soundtrack and that aesthetic horror, I, it, like, I guess go back to your description of it, is is compelling to i mean i don't know do you think it's compelling to women is that even anything that like we could even intelligently talk about well i don't know i don't know if we could make that sort of a generalization but one thing we can talk about in terms of gender in this movie and Mm -hmm. what i'm thinking of as aesthetic horror is that almost all of these films that are sort of happening now they don't have final girls Mm -hmm. they have female protagonists Mm -hmm who are sometimes victims, sometimes not, but also strangely like they're all pretty much, almost all of them, made by men Mm -hmm. with not a leading actress, but almost like a muse. Right. Like all of these films, the lead actress, you really feel like they're the muse of the film. They're not just someone who won the audition and and read the script to the bestest right that there was a deep relationship between the director it's and like, the uh performer like tarantino and uma thurman like he right. wrote kill bill because of uma thurman right yeah and oftentimes these films even though they're often very surfacey mm-hmm. they're very aesthetic yeah um the women in them often have these rich inner lives that are hinted to mm-hmm. that i think is really interesting yeah you know, and then, I mean, horror movies have always been about beautiful women. I mean, just in the past, it was like tits out and run. That was like kind of the vibe of the horror movie. And you get to feel like a lot of early horror movies. That should be the subtitle. Tits out podcast. and run. <laughs> well, there is a, like an almost tits out and run scene at the end. You know, That's although, true. You know, although Elle Fanning's 16, so they're not out. Right. Um, but, you know, I think these horror movies are sort of attracting, on one end, like with these auteur films just a higher class of actress, like almost like this like weird top shelf Wes Anderson type actress. And on the other side of it, you're getting these really fun like genre girls, like the type of girls that might like cosplay at Comic-Con, you know, because there's outside of this auteur filmmaker, there's an entire world of what I would like in a, in the most generous way possible refer to as fanboy horror. You know, and these are like films uh, like Hatchet 1, 2, and 3 by Adam Green. And, you know, he also directed a really fun movie called Digging Up the Marrow. And these movies like revel in genre tropes and, and, and just gore effects and really, really fun acting. And I, I think all those films really descend from, like, whereas all these auteur movies, I think, descend from Stanley Kubrick. Yep. You know, I, I think these fun movies descend from joss whedon you know like they're they're fun they're self self-referential uh they include humor a lot of the uh the pleasure of those films is the interaction between the characters like you get the feeling that they're friends and that like i'm sorry are you talking about are you talking about this new aesthetic auteur horror or pre you're talking about these other well, fanboy this, films. Th- i would say that this is almost like a galapagos island thing right like where like some of them reach back to like 70s Kubrick style filmmaking and then some of them kind of pick up off of this Joss Whedon style horror and you know they don't really touch I don't think interesting you should bring that up because the way I've been thinking about this and I don't want to go too far from the neon demon but thinking about this this new uh direction in horror film I was thinking about Joss Whedon as well but in a Mm -hmm. different way I was been thinking about Cabin in the Woods Mm -hmm. as maybe being the signpost a very artificial one, but I'm just going mm-hmm. with it. That like, after Cabin in the Woods, everything referenced in that film is over, mm-hmm. and all of these films we're now talking about mm-hmm. are in the wake of Cabin in the Woods right. about something else. Right. They are drawing other influences. They are picking up a different history. They're not looking to former totally. horror films, except maybe Argento and, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre- but pretty much like, once Cabin in the Woods happened. 
everything. It was slasher, Japanese horror, torture yep. porn, yeah. m- monster movies, done. Yep. Now we have The Witch, The Neon Demon, Amer, Under the Skin. And these are not films that are continuations of Freddy and Saw and whatever else, what uh, those up Hatchet, yeah. and, you know. And I don't, and you know, Hatchet is definitely one of those movies, but it, it's like, it's fun and it's supposed to be fun. Right. And, you know, and, but you can, no, you're right, you can no longer take that serious, you know, you, and because, you know, I remember watching like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and just being all in when I was a little kid. I mean, I think it came in like 1986, I'm like 10 years old. <laughs> Uh, it was terrifying. Now you look at it and you're like, what? Well, this is hilarious. And then I think you're right about like movies, like kind of making this like line in the sand about like what's not going to be acceptable as groundbreaking anymore. I mean, think about like after Scream, you can't kill off a black character in a horror movie in the same way. Unless you're Fear the Walking Dead, which the fir- pretty much the first two kills are black people. Right, but I mean, even good up job, in, guys. Well, even up until I mean, this is going to be spoiler. Sorry, this show sucks. But like the Fear of the Walking Dead, the new one, um, the new season, the, the new season. I, I, won't I mean, touch like it. one of the main characters. Yeah, it sucks. One of the main characters, Strand. I mean, he's still alive. You know, that's a that's a pretty good run. <laughs> God damn it! Um, I think another line in the sand thing is not necessarily. I mean, there's partly my thing of like once. Kevin in the woods showed it you're done I think there's also like I think that the sort of like pulling back the curtain Mm -hmm. not only makes it just jokes over but there's also like jump scares yeah what's the point now what we like how many how many more films that rely on a jump scare yeah can we really sit through how many more in the same way as like first person cam uh things like that like these tropes on one hand, the tropes are the monster, the slasher, the Japanese schoolgirl with her hair in her face, the mm-hmm. jaw that opens wider than humanly possible. Right. And the other part of the trope is these filmic techniques that have been refined and refined and refined where they're actually super fucking effective. Yeah, yeah. But by repetition, totally useless as mm-hmm. uh, as decent filmmaking i mean i think a jump scare now is uh is just a gag like more often than not like a jump stare illicit or a jump scare like a jump stare could you imagine a jump stare where just somebody like leers i mean i guess that's kind of it follows that's a john right? crawford t- no i mean like all, it follows is one long jump stare it's terrifying <laughs> totally. uh but these jump scares are usually like played for get and laughs you know and i i think that horror has really become uh, you know how like people like there was a time when pirates were terrifying. Now people wear sexy pirate costumes. And I think horror as a whole has sort of become one massive sexy Halloween costume. And these movies are escaping a little bit. They're they're kind of they're going their own way. There's hope. Yeah. I mean In the or, darkness. Or maybe not even necessarily hope, you know, and there's definitely a place for those those goofy movies. Like I, I think Cabin in the Woods probably my favorite horror movie the last 20 years so good. yeah well we definitely haven't talked about what happens yet like the end of the movie we what, do, any, what does we, happen well you know <laughs> okay so <laughs> what do we know what for do we, sure what do we know for sure happens well before, she gets she gets pushed off before we move into the end i want right. to I, I do want to talk about the restaurant scene which we keep dipping our toe in and getting out of and the restaurant scene is uh, it follows the very long runway show scene, and it follows up the entire scene where she's been cast. And during her casting, the the fashion designer character is just so bored he can't even stand it when he's looking at all these models. And then we talked about it earlier. He has like the knuckle biting thing, and he's like, "Oh my god, I can't believe it!" And then, right after that casting scene happens, Jesse goes into the bathroom after she hears something smash and she discovers the character Sarah, Abby Lee's character, on the ground smoking a cigarette. She's broken a mirror and torn up her own headshots. And they have this really amazing exchange, which is probably my favorite exchange. It's my favorite line in the movie where she's like, what's it like to walk into a room and it's winter and you're the sun? And 
And Jesse says, it's everything. And that is like such a chilling line in that movie. And I, I think that that line is really what moves this I would say if I, you need to give this like a letter grade, it goes from like a B minus to a B plus for me <laughs> just because of that line, because it's so haunting. And then Jesse moves back a little bit, cuts her hand open, and the model character reaches over and tries to like drink the blood off of her hand. So right there, that's... That's really, I think, the first moment in the film where it goes off the rails. You're like, what the fuck? And I think that is, uh, uh, the, I think you have to think of that there is a supernatural motivation of some sort in this moment for that to have happened, you know? Because otherwise, like, who would do that? That's super crazy. I mean, well, necrophilia is pretty fucked up, but the drink, but drinking someone else's blood, it, yeah. it starts to lead into ruby ruby fucking a corpse is like fucked up and weird Dr when she drinks the blood off her hand it's a little bit like oh this is going somewhere else yes we're going somewhere with this yeah and then you've already had like the idea that these are like ethereally beautiful people and then you know like jenna malone's character like jenna malone's i think is absolutely gorgeous but she's not as gorgeous as the other girls, right? So there's the thing of like, okay, maybe there's something going on here where these like she ha seems to have this, these two other creatures enthralled to her. So it definitely sets up this like triumvirate sort of maybe like master and her like you know younger vampire kind of thing or whatever. It, you know, I don't want to say it's a vampire. I don't want to say it's a witch or whatever. Maybe it's some new monster that we've never even thought of which is to me very exciting like some new mythology but then again you're back to um the fact that he talks about refn talks about count bathory or elizabeth bathory being an influence on this film yeah. you know there's two major influences on the story one is his own daughters are in school and seem to be refn's daughters seem to be becoming immersed in this world of beauty and his i guess his daughters take after his wife who's supposed to be very beautiful i've never seen her but you know he's watching these people who are born beautiful they grow up beautiful and then they're interacting in this world and Ruffin's initial impulse was what's it like to be born beautiful it's just it's such an unusual perspective on the world and it's also so terrifying that that's what these people will be judged on so that's the anxiety that he's touching on but then he also talks about the legend of Count Bathory, or Countess Bathory, who is uh, probably the most prolific female serial killer in the world. She, do you know that whole story? Oh. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. You're a vampire fanatic. But for audiences who may not have heard it, there is a there is a countess. She is said to have had some sort of like crazy obsession with remaining young. And one of the ways she became young was like bathing herself in the blood of virgins. Like, I mean, I guess she would, just like Jenna Malone's character in this film, fill up a bathtub full of blood and just lay around in it and hope that it worked. So that character is very influential in the vampire narrative. So I think it pulls you right back into like, this is a quasi vampire movie for sure. But one of the things that kind of pushes it out of being a quasi vampire movie is this whole idea that people are aging out constantly. Like basically you have this window between 16 and 19 and at 20 you're done. And that gets talked about by several characters in the movie. And in that scene where she's like, oh, you know, what's it like to be, the, you know, the son, the model who has presumably not gotten this role because she's been passed up because she's too old. She's seen her before. And she says, I'm a ghost. And you're like, okay, that's, that's interesting. You're like past beauty. I don't know where we go from there. I don't know. I, I do think it's interesting that Jenna Malone's, that Ruby, despite not being a model, is the one we mostly see bathing in mm -hmm. the blood. Yeah. Um, we do get that completely ridiculous, like, it's almost like a shower scene from an 80s sex comedy romp mm -hmm. from like 83 or something, where yeah. we see the two models, like, showering completely naked with although blood spilling off of them that's not too teen comedy but no. um jenna malone is the jenna malone's character is the one we see bathing and bleeding um yeah. she seems the most entrenched in she's the one who commits the murder mm -hmm. and she's the one who has that moon ritual um and yeah. she's not even she's not even a model <laughs> yeah i mean which is like is she something else you know who knows but you know so she goes on from that weird scene where like there's like the pseudo vampirism then she goes through the show and basically like she hops over the the girl who represents unnatural beauty because that girl's like i didn't even have to audition for this and they have this exchange about 
whether or not it's good to have plastic surgery. Yeah. And it's the second exchange in the film that talks about plastic surgery. And the first one, um, the model Gigi, who's I, I think probably the least likable of all the girls. And then I think, I mean, she's beautiful too, but you're told so many times in the film and in the scene that I'm desperately trying to get us to talk about in a second, um, about like how her unnatural beauty is just whack. And it's just, it's just not actually appealing. And she thinks that she's like something special because she's made all this effort. So I think she would be like actually the like the Aronofsky character. Like she's done all this stuff to herself mm-hmm. to get to that position. And, you know, even having gone down a cup size so that she could be more modely. So I mean she probably was actually more appealing to an average man before all this, but she's made herself into this like really narrow definition of beauty, which is a, which is a model. And then they're sitting there she tries to like alpha Jesse and says, that's my chair, move bitch. And then the the PA comes in, the, the assistant says, hey, come talk to the fashion director. He lets her know that she's going to close out the show, which I don't know anything about fashion, but I guess that's a big deal. Yeah, so she closes out the show. She's like the headliner. You, you get the prettiest dress. Yeah, you get the prettiest <laughs> dress. It's amazing. Um, and so right after that whole sequence happens, where basically Jessie has moved into like the pole position. She's number one in the model world. She shows up at the restaurant with her uh, her boyfriend guy who was the photographer of her first photo shoot. And the fashion director, who's played by Alessandro Nivola in an uncredited role, which, which is, is super weird. weird because he has the most dialogue in the film, uh, I think maybe. Like maybe. He, well, he has the longest, the longest kind of like sustained speech in the film so she comes in with the boyfriend and he's sitting with another model from the show who briefly talks about how she was an actress but her voice didn't match her face and so Gigi says well you can just change your face and then the the fashion director says don't do that like everybody can just read unnatural beauty it's just horseshit and it sucks and everybody knows it sucks and he's been like basically bloviating about the nature of beauty and what's awesome and what it means to be a creator and all this stuff. And he's just, I mean, you really pick up that he's a terrible person, kind of. So Gigi won't let Jesse sit with them at the table. It's a total mean girls moment. And so they have to sit at the table next over. And so after they have this brief exchange over whether or not somebody's beautiful or not, if they've had work done, he turns to the boyfriend and says, hey, check her out, check Gigi out. What do you think? And he looks at her, and he's already kind of out of his element, right? And he says, well, I guess she's fine. And he's like, exactly, she's fine. And he's like, you can sit down now. He makes Gigi sit back down. They all turn to Jesse. He's like, what do you think about Jesse? You know, this is perfection. This is real beauty. So he makes this objective and subjective. Well, it's it's subjective because it's coming from him, right? But he's implying that there's an objective beauty standard, or there's an objective most beautiful, and it's Jesse. And then the guy, he tries to kind of be the good guy. And he's like, yeah, I think she's beautiful inside too, which is a lie because there's nothing going on with Jesse other than her face. And the fashion director says, hey, man, you're full of shit. You wouldn't even stop to talk to her if she wasn't beautiful. And you know it's true. And then Jesse basically says, kick rocks to the boyfriend. And then at that moment, she's basically part of the club. You know, So that moves us past that restaurant scene, which I think is an interesting scene um that Refn talks about this movie being funny i don't read it as funny at all uh, unless y- un- you could maybe think of it as satire but it's not funny yeah it could be camp and then the double toasted guys uh they had they sort of picked up on the humor of it but they said you know this is like somebody who thinks they're funny telling you a joke that isn't funny and that's kind of how I read after I, I like I would have never picked up any element of humor in this movie. Um, but after hearing Refn and other like dudes like trying to just blow him in interviews, talk about how funny it was, you know, like people are like, oh, Burroughs is so hilarious. I read every Burroughs book ever. I've never like laughed out loud reading any of that stuff. I mean, it's there's things that are amusing, but it's not funny the way like Bill Burr or Louis C.K. is funny. You know, you're not going to, like, guffaw. I mean, there's, like, that talking asshole scene that everybody thinks is funny in Naked Lunch, but it's not that funny. Anyway, so the character, this this uh, this actor that plays the fashion designer, he is 
really badly overacting when he looks at her, you know, and, and it, it's so... Well, like he's badly overacting when they walk in and he's doing his Henry V exactly. soliloquy. Exactly. Henry V? Yeah, it's Henry V. Yeah. He's doing the, like, once more into the breach speech, um, which is, you know, it's, again, such an L.A. thing to do. You know, he's, like, quoting Shakespeare to these models, you know, like he's, like he's an actor, and they make this whole deal about how he's an actor because he's just naturally creative. So he can be great at acting because he has this inner depth. But there's right across from him three women who are all basically models acting. So it's kind of this weird meta moment, which, I mean, who knows if it's intentional or whatever? Who knows if anything's intentional? But, you know, you have purposeful bad acting juxtaposed against, I guess natural bad acting i mean not that any of these girls are like bad actresses but they're not like meryl streep you know so i don't know what do you think about like that camp moment that character is if there is a funny character in the movie it's him probably i mean i think the the film is kind of absurd it's right. never funny but it's absurd and i think that and so maybe it's amusing if it's not I, yeah, it's not amusing but i think it, it is absurd that all of the premises of this movie are absurd. Mm -hmm. It's got all this tension and these elements of horror films like, well, dr like dread I mean, and blood, really sure. Blood, yeah. But um, ultimately it's just, it's like, let's be frank, it's completely ridiculous. Like yeah. this, this young girl walks into town and she's the most beautiful person on earth as if that even has meaning and all these other women who are, you know, models are competing and there's all this status about like who can be the prettiest and they're all, they're all great. Yeah. They're all, they just look so nice. And so, and it really sort of unravels the lie, the, the construct of what beauty is. Yeah. But by using only people that the LA system has already decided yeah. are beautiful, um, so it's sort of like reveling in this ridiculous lie about yeah. how we construct beauty and perpetuate that construct. Do you think that narrative requires the concept of objective beauty? Like, for instance, in um, uh, the Iliad, right? I mean, in the real world, like maybe half the Greeks would be like, dude, dog, she's not that fine. We're not sailing to war for that girl, right? But in the story... She is that, Helen Troy is that beautiful, and it forces the Greeks to sail and fight. You know, and in this movie, you don't get all this insane behavior without a fictional object of beauty. I think that any conversation about beauty and objectivity and subjectivity mm -hmm. requires somehow quickly veering into ideas about fascism and control and uh, racism and the objectification mostly mm -hmm. of women and of bodies. And I think that it, I think that it all becomes really precarious mm -hmm. where there's just so much subjective material that we too easily allow to feel objective. Right. Well, and I'm not... And I'm I, not... Think, I think that's a balancing act. Um, like, and I'm not pointing fingers here. Yeah. I'm just sort of saying, like, I think that's this weird balancing act that we're always doing where, like, taste is subjective. But I always use the word great when I talk about things I like. Yeah. And I don't actually mean it's great. It, I just, it just feels better. Yep. And, you know, I speak very hyperbolically all the time. Yeah. If I think about it, I don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that applies to beauty as well. Um we can talk about right. like she's beautiful, but what the fuck does that mean? Well, so I, I mean, to clarify, the idea a of bit. beauty is the idea of beauty is totally a construct, and it's total nonsense, and it's something we all prop up. So when we're talking about it, we're talking about this thing we're propping up, right? Like, mm -hmm. where where do we agree that we're both willing to sort of like prop up this idea and not yeah, yeah. not deconstruct as we're discussing it? Yeah. So you know, there, there's two things I, I think I'm suggesting here. Is yeah. one is I don't think it's the scope of this podcast to like go through the classical. I mean, this is the problem of beauty and philosophy to find. I mean, when you look up uh, beauty and philosophy in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it, the tension is between is beauty subjective or objective? And mm -hmm. you have every major great philosopher has kind of something to say. And they all basically lean to the concept of objective beauty, basically like past Kant, 
you know like i mean he is his assertion and i'm i could be very easily misunderstanding this is that there is an objective beauty but objective beauty is sort of worth it's meaningless it doesn't have any actual meaning so you know i don't want to steer us down that direction and i think we could have a very interesting conversation about it because i do believe in objective beauty um who knows why but i just kind of do you know like in a world in in this world i would really rather have sex with Uma Thurman than Lana Dunham. Like, you know what I mean? So that, that to me it implies a hierarchy. And I think when you have a hierarchy, you want to say that there's a best. But, you know, I mean, most of our listeners are going to completely not be down with this idea here. But They've like, already shut it right. off. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure they have. But maybe there's something a little bit like Wittgenstein's language games, where it's like, maybe there isn't, maybe there's sort of a hierarchy in the way that you learn a language that there can be a more beautiful but it's slippery in places. It's like these interlocking triangles of beauty. But I, what I really want to get at is in this movie, objective beauty is a force in the way that like in the real world, gravity yes. might be a force. And that's kind of what I'm more I'm getting at is yes. like not so much like in our world is beauty objective and subjective. I don't think it's anything that you could ever settle because I don't think anything can be settled. But in this movie, it seems like there is like a, there's an almost a magnetic force to her beauty that yes. drives everyone insane. And in that respect, it's almost like a curse. And so that brings us into the witch territory again, yep. whereas is her, is her beauty in the very end a curse? Because after the show, she goes back to her hotel room and has this dream sequence where Keanu Reeves' character comes into her room and very creepily inserts a knife into her mouth. Like it's like a very clear representation of her fear of penetration. Because she's like a she's a she's a virgin, and that's one of the things that makes her so special, and one of the things that makes her sacrifice interesting in the end. But you get this dream sequence where Keanu Reeves's character is basically like like assaults her sexually with a knife, and then she wakes up and she's all freaked out. And then somebody tries to enter her room. She throws the deadbolt on. And the person gives up on her room and goes next door and assaults the girl who's 13 years old. And then rather than calling the police or anything that like a normal person would do, she calls Ruby and goes to Ruby, the house that Ruby's sitting in. And then I heard a video SSA that had this idea and I, I wish I remembered whose it was. I would love to give them credit for it, but I mean, but I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. But the idea that maybe she does die in that sexual assault and maybe it's not a dream. And then where she goes into the house is purgatory because no one lives there. Ruby says no one lives here. And then Ruby becomes this sort of like devil character, which I think is provocative, but not at all groundable in any, any way. So this moves us into the final sequence, which is she goes to stay with Ruby. Ruby rescues her. And Ruby, who has been basically like a really above board character and very sweet and looking out for her the whole time. Yeah finds out that she's a virgin well first first she kind of makes a move on her because it's it's kind of like you know you know jesse is being pretty seductive in this particular scene she's like oh i think you're so great and then ruby kind of makes a move on her and jesse's like no 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 no, it's not like that and then ruby shuts down and she's like oh shit sorry thought you were down with this well I mean, Ruby doesn't take no for an answer and has well, to be thrown. But there's a moment that happens before she has to be thrown off, which mm. is she says, I've never been with anybody like that. And then that's what makes Ruby go, oh, and she's like, I want to be your first. And then you have right. this very peculiar, like, lesbian sexual assault, which you don't really see hardly ever in films. And um, then Jesse throws her off. And then from that moment on, you know, Jesse goes off and the next scene she's applying her own makeup which sort of says oh i don't need ruby anymore like not only has she gone beyond like she's beaten every level boss in this movie you know <laughs> and and you know the very end i guess level boss to this movie i mean i don't even i don't even play video games i don't know why i'm bringing it up like but that. it's a, no but it's actually it's it's a yeah. great it's a great way to think about yes yeah. so like these three characters that she's defeated kind of form one monster at the end and then you see this like sort of foreshadowed through the movie like triangles are throughout the whole movie like the thaumaturgic triangle which i think was probably picked up from jodorowsky you know, like Refn and Jodorowsky are friends. They're bros. Which, yeah, they're like super buddies. And there's a, there's, I posted this on our Facebook page if you want to go check it out. But there's a really uh, neat video where Jodorowsky is reading Refn's tarot cards. And 
it's uh, the question he asks is, hey, I'm making this movie, Only God Forgives, right now. Is it going to be successful? And Jodorowsky looks at him and says, you're thinking too much about this movie being a success, and it's not going to be successful if you do. He's like, you just made Drive, and you weren't thinking about success, and it was great. And then, you know, we all know what happens. Only God Forgives sucks balls. You know, and, and Jodorowsky in this moment becomes sort of a sage. But um, that's a that's a super big rabbit hole we could go down to, which we're just going to skip over because of time here. So they become like this monster and they like chase her around in the house after she's become this like ultimate like symbol of narcissism and like beautiful power. And then they murder her and then they eat her. Awesome. Yeah, it's great. Um, what do you think about like after they've eaten her? And clearly for the purposes of like absorbing her beauty, there's the weird scene in the moonlight where uh, Ruby births like more blood than who knows you can imagine. I mean, like, I don't know what to make of that. But then this movie sort of ends at the beginning of the third act. Like these. Yes. Yeah. Like, so these girls, they have eaten her and then Gigi and Sarah go off to a fashion shoot with the original photographer, Jack. And during this photo shoot, Sarah is not cast. She's just hanging out while Gigi is like being photographed. And the photographer looks around and notices how suddenly gorgeous and rejuvenated Sarah is. And he fires one of the other models. And now Gigi and Sarah are both in this scene. And then Gigi starts throwing up. And like, it's like she can't absorb the beauty. And I think that's almost like it's like you have to be super beautiful in order to absorb the beauty. And since she's like not actually beautiful, she can't absorb it. And then she throws up and- Not Jesse, actually, you mean you mean genuinely from birth? Genuinely yeah. from birth, yeah. Like she's, she, because, because her beauty is manufactured, she can't handle this power that she's absorbed. And she throws up the eye onto the ground. And that's the scene that everybody really talks about is she throws up this eyeball and then Sarah reaches down after Gigi cuts herself open with a pair of scissors to get to get uh, Jesse out of her, which is fucking crazy. Like, why would you do that? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You like, wouldn't you want to try throwing up a little bit more first before you cut yourself open? And this is the thing I think is just sloppy in the film. And then Sarah reaches down and eats the eyeball which is just an awesome scene because she's just so cold. And then she just walks back out to finish the photo shoot like nothing happened. I mean, like, you know, and that's it. That's the movie. I mean, what do you think about that final sequence? I mean, I think it's great. I mean, I again think that Refn tends to throw out a lot of signifiers slightly at random. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a Scrabble game or bottle yeah. where it's just like, I think that to look at this and want a direct interpretation is to think a little bit too much about his intentions mm -hmm. as opposed to letting it be open. And, well, you can think of it this way. You can think of it this way. You can think of it this way. I thought it was great. I, mm -hmm. Meaning, uh, eyeball, the, the, the gaze, you know, mm -hmm. digesting beauty, um, taking on the beauty of another... Um, aging out. I think these are all, you know, intersecting in that moment. But mm -hmm. as far as a, some sort of concrete interpretation, I don't think I don't think it's worthy of one interpretation. I think it's just a lot of very open signifiers that make sense in the context mm -hmm. of this film. Like, you know, her cutting open her stomach is completely ridiculous. But again, this entire film is totally preposterous. Right. So it didn't. I didn't feel like it was a curveball or anything. Yeah. I was just like, yep, that's that's what that character does when she can't digest another human body. <laughs> well, one thing I really like kind of got a lot of pleasure out of was thinking about what the conversation between Sarah and the people in the photo shoot was right afterwards. Totally. Like, yeah. My Don't mom, go in there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she had to go. There's a mess. <laughs> you know, that, which I think is it's pretty funty. And, I, you know, it's just, it's just a, it's, you know, it's what my mom would call a weird movie. Sure. She's like, this is a weird movie. Like, she's super southern. She's like, I liked it, but it was weird. Well, it is weird, and and I think that you know when I was saying, referring to it as a bit random, you, you and I tend to refer to 
methods of vanquishment mm-hmm. and the rules of engagement as a way to think through the way horror movies function. Right. I think in this movie, methods of vanquishment, uh, they they push her in the deep end and eat her. Like it's sort of yeah. uh, there's not. It's hard to talk about or like the rules of engagement. I don't know what they are. I don't. Right. I don't know who these people are, or what they're yeah. doing, or what their powers are, or it, it's just so open. You know, like Raffin says that Jesse is the neon demon. Like he says that. Like he's in an interview. He's like Jesse is the neon. He's like she is the neon neon well, demon. Well, he claims to have only discovered that halfway through making the movie. Yeah, he didn't know until he realized it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know an interpretation that seems to pop up in comment sections and stuff a lot is that either the fashion industry or LA itself is the neon demon. And I think... Well, before I read interviews with him, that was my impression. Me too. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think he, the way he described like why the term neon demon, I think I really picked up on it that like neon is just sort of like simultaneously retro and futuristic. Mm-hmm. In one interview, he talks about this being a science fiction movie, which... Uh, you know, I uh, nah. uh, no, <laughs> like, like, sorry, man, you're wrong about. Your I would film. say it's just barely horror. It's totally not science fiction. Yeah, I mean, cause but it, good for him. Whatever. Yeah, g- whatever. It, you know, like, he made his movie. He's Danish. Maybe there's some like Danish sci-fi thing that we're not aware <laughs> of that is is yet to be discovered by us Americans. But when talking about what did it mean? Mm-hmm. I think he really, especially in this film, is coming from a place of surrealism and, mm-hmm. you know, coming back to Jodorowsky. I think that thinking about, like, the eyeball and this cutting open the belly and things like that, like, what did it mean is, I mean, it's sort of like looking at the holy mountain and pointing mm-hmm. to one scene and going, well, what did that mean? Like, well, I can throw you some ideas that, some impressions, but right. meaning, I don't know. Well, the thing I think about when I think about Jodorowsky, and, and if anybody's not familiar, we're talking about Alejandro Jodorowsky, who's a, a, a cult filmmaker. Who's and, a comic book artist who reads stroke cards and happened to have made some of the best movies ever. Yeah, and is like a total metaphysician. He has a really, really enjoyable book called Psychomagic, which is an interview form. Have you read that book? No. It's basically... I didn't even know about it. It's him laying out kind of his uh, theory of like magic with a K, like why he thinks like magic works and why he thinks that tarot cards work and he even wrote a very thick uh tarot card book it's like 400 pages and it's probably as detailed as any book on the tarot i've ever seen uh which is just peculiar they're like this dude yeah, wouldn't even have time for that um he's a, a really interesting resource to him, I think, is the documentary about the movie Dune. That Jodorowsky's Dune is an yeah. essential movie to watch if you're a science fiction fan. And this is why I think Jodorowsky is so important to this movie. And this podcast is definitely going long. I see you looking at the clock. I'm like, yeah, it's just going to be long. It's like, suck it, listeners. Like, you're just going to have to deal with it. But, you know, like the, I think that there's something extra. Let's just make this episode, like, eight hours long and just... Well, look. People just stop listening. In, in the spirit of Jodorowsky, his version of Dune was going to be like 13 hours long, which is right. one of the reasons why it couldn't get made. Let's so this, give him his due for a yeah, moment here. So, so in the spirit of Jodorowsky, we're going to go over here. You know, like Jodorowsky's whole concept of a filmmaker and even as a uh, as a creator is that part of becoming a thing is making things. And it's not this corny, like stupid, shitty marketing guy, fake it to you, you make it sort of thing. It's that the creation of artwork is a magical act that transforms you. And I think there's there's evidence in uh, Refn's demeanor before and after the Neon Demon that this movie seemed to have had some sort of effect like that on him. Like He talks about how his style changed. And you look at him before and after the film, you know, his haircut's better, his clothes are better, he seems to like care more about fashion, and the drive really made him famous, but I think this movie really elevated him, because it was so slippery that people were like, okay, is he really, a, a, is this a genius movie? I don't know. And Something I think really interesting about him as a person in this movie mm-hmm. is that he, in many interviews, refers to like, all men have a 16 year old girl inside them. Which and he I don't said even in understand. particular, well, he said yeah. about him and often yeah. said about himself, like, I always feel like there's a 16 year old girl inside me. And this was the movie about like getting to explore that. And I thought that's an interesting way to think about things. But then watching this movie with the commentary, which is just Elle Fanning and Refn, 
it's so boring because mm. you're basically listening to two teenagers just sort of go like, remember that part? Oh, that guy. Oh, I remember when we shot this scene. It's the most banal. It's such a boring description and way to follow the movie. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, that in itself, I couldn't get through it, mm -hmm. but in itself was super fascinating. Like, here's this guy who's just like the most impossible interview, and he's so fucking pretentious. But then when he's hanging out with Elle Fanning talking about this project they worked on together, mm -hmm. he's actually like a little girl. Yeah, and the, the tone of his interviewing style has changed from film to film too. And now it's like, I, there's almost like this thing that people do around like genius it's you know, every once in a while like you know the whole idea of like the art hustle like is this person actually genius or are they genius just because everybody says they are yeah. and there's a third route which is like you just sort of say you're genius and then you make impenetrable sure. content and then half the people are fooled and half the people aren't and you know maybe there's a little bit of an art hustle going on here in that regard but i like the movie so much that and, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going with that. I mean, who's to say if somebody's genius? I think the concept of the art hustle that you described seems to me to be just a fiction. That there are people who will bullshit mm -hmm. and wrangle the PR machine. But I think everybody's just flailing and some people are better at PR. Yeah. You know, that's whole, that's my very cynical take on well, it. Yeah, true. But the other, you know, the other thing too is like, do you remember that movie Basquiat, the one about sure. Jean-Michel Basquiat? I feel like that movie did a really strong disservice to his legacy because in the whole movie, the I mean, it's definitely interesting. You have David Bowie playing uh, Andy Warhol, and it's kind of a cool movie, and it looks great. It's like early, you know, it's like seventies New York or whatever. But when I came away from that movie, I never really got too deep into Basquiat's work because. I was the movie sort of makes it out to be like he was performing an art hustle, and then when you go see those paintings in real life, you look at them and you're like, man, these are fucking great. Like these are just great paintings, and they might not be everybody's cup of tea, but like I was of the opinion that people who liked his artwork were retarded, and when I saw them in person, I was completely blown away by them. So you know, I who knows you know maybe it's maybe genius is real and the art hustle is fake i mean whoa <laughs> <laughs> so there we are all right uh, let's uh let's fade to black and roll the credits i think yeah uh if you stuck with us this long you are probably a super fan which means you need to go over to itunes and rate and review us if you don't know how to do that go to our instagram page uh at scary thoughts dot podcast uh, very early in the feed. We're not too that deep into it. I think so it was the first it. post. It's like the first post is this explanation of how to rate and review a podcast because iTunes doesn't make it easy because they hate freedom. Next time we're going to be doing uh, House of the Devil by request. This may be the, probably the last time we do something by request because next time this podcast is on, we'll probably have like 50,000 fans and we won't be able to do it. But that's part of that art hustle. <laughs> uh, I'm Chad Lott. I'm Mark Kate. And this is Scary Thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, guys.